call the Sunday after the Super Bowl. <laughs> and I wanted to thank everyone for the outpouring of support, thoughts, and cards, and well wishes, because the Eagles did not win the Super Bowl. So, but we're glad you're here, and we have a very exciting transfiguration service for you today. And with that, I'll hand it over. Sure, to you. and the Eagles were even the right liturgical colors. Yes, yeah, so they're, they're green. Green and green. Disappointment all around. Well, we have exciting things going on in Children's Church today. We are observing Transfiguration Sunday in Children's Church. We're going to learn about what happens on this mountain and what we get to find up on this mountain as well. So, kiddos, if you want to come with me, we are going to uh, make our way to Children's Church. And we have a special guest this week. Pastor Robin is joining us, too, to come and see what we do in Children's Church, because she'll be leading us next week. And a bonus. At the end of worship today, we are going to get to do something very special that we got to do last year, and we'll talk about it during the children's church. So then we'll come back and be ready to go. So, uh, let's see. Jonah, would you want to grab the cross and lead us on our way through? That's perfect. And we'll all follow Jonah out to the children's room, and we'll see you all back in time for communion. <laughs> all right, we'll see you soon. With the congregation, please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, Forgive us, that we may be reconciled to one another, for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says the Lord, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.
generation of your son. You confirm the mysteries of the faith by the witness of Moses and Elijah, and in the voice from the bright cloud declaring Jesus, your beloved son. You foreshadowed our adoption as your children. Make us heirs with Christ in your glory and bring us to enjoy its fullness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there. I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up onto the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Look, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called the mountains to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the Israelites. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Word of God, word of life. He's not the only one. 
because two other ghosts join him. Moses and Elijah have been dead for hundreds of years. And then, as they are talking amongst themselves, and the disciples are just sitting there spellbound by all of this, God's voice comes down from heaven and says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And then as quickly as it began, it was over. God's voice disappears, the ghosts are gone, and Jesus returns back to his normal self. He tells his disciples, don't tell anyone about this until after I'm gone, and they go down the mountain. I mean, what, what does that all mean? How do we make sense of that? It's very confusing, and obviously it was confusing for Peter, who didn't know what to say. He, he's standing there in the midst of it, and says, oh, Lord, I, I think it's, it's good for us to be here. Um, let's make a, a tent for you, uh, for Elijah, uh, and for Moses, and for us. If, if Peter was confused, then you can bet that we are all confused. And then I have something that I struggle with when it comes to the transfiguration. I struggle with it because it clearly is showing the divinity of God, right? And I know, I'm not saying the divinity of God is bad, but it's hard to understand. We, we, we weren't invited up on this mountain with Jesus. In fact, only three disciples were invited to join. Those, the, those in the inner circle, the rest were left behind. And so we weren't there to experience it. We read about it, we hear about it, but we weren't there. And I'm not so sure I would have wanted to be there. As a child, I was scared just watching the movie The Ten Commandments and hearing God's voice booming down from heaven to Moses giving him the commandments. I don't think I could handle, even as an adult, hearing God's voice like that coming out of nowhere. I would have been terrified. And, and I don't know if I can feel the closeness of God when I think about the divinity of God, of Jesus floating like a ghost, turning bright white. I, I just don't know. And it brings to mind the question of Jesus being fully divine, yet fully human. Yes, we need the fully divine part. Only a fully divine individual or individuals could, could save us from our sins, could, could heal this broken world. I know that. But, but what I draw close to is the human side of Jesus. I, I don't know how we understand Jesus being fully divine and fully human at the same time. I know we're Lutherans and this both and concept. We're sinners and saints at the same time. That I can understand, but I can't understand the fully divine Jesus and the fully human Jesus. Jesus is fully human, and he, and he had to make mistakes. He couldn't have been perfect. I mean, let's just think about this. Think about Jesus and his childhood. What do we know about his childhood? Not much, right? Except for that one time. That one time he was left behind in the temple. Actually, he stayed behind in the temple. And his parents were worried sick for days, not knowing where he was, thinking he was abducted. And when they find him in the temple, he says, Mother, Father, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? <laughs> now think about your child. If your child just started, kind of ran away, <laughs> and started talking to strange adults, and left you worried, would you think your child was perfect? <laughs> Probably not. I'm sure that you would have some words to say to your child sense. And, and to think that Jesus could have been perfect, at least by our definition of the word perfect, maybe God's definition of perfect is different than our definition of perfect. But the way we see perfection, you know, Jesus as a perfect child, that would have really an interesting dynamics between him and his parents, right? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine raising a perfect child? I mean, who, if the child's always right and the parents are, are wrong from time to time. And get this, apparently, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Can you imagine being the brother or sister of Jesus? When you get in trouble for something, <laughs> and, and you say, oh yeah, yeah, of course it was me, Mom. Yeah, it could have been Jesus. He never does anything wrong. He's perfect. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, seriously, some, some, Pastors and theologians have guessed. That's why we don't know much about Jesus' childhood. 
Because as a kid, he had to have done some naughty things. He had to have gotten in, into trouble. And they wanted to maintain that perfect image of Jesus, so they wouldn't mention anything about his childhood. But I want to know. I want to know more about the things that he did and who he was when he was younger. And even as an adult, it's almost like I need to hear that he made mistakes. I mean, you mean to tell me that there was times where he didn't wake up on the wrong side of the mat and didn't kind of bite the heads off of his disciples? I mean, we know he got angry and he overturned the table in the temple with the money changers. There's one instance where Jesus calls a woman a dog. And we pastors for centuries have been trying to defend Jesus' actions because he said this. But, but what if, let's just wrestle with this idea of Jesus not being perfect according to our definition of perfect. Because for me, I can't relate to a, a totally perfect Jesus. I, I can't understand a glowing God. I, I need a God who goes down into the valley with me, who knows what it's like to fail, who knows what it's like to forget to pray and forget about others from time to time. I don't know if you need that as well, but it, it helps us relate to God better, to know that we're not alone, and, and, and to know that it's okay to fail. I like to see what Jesus did after failing, and how he bounced back from all. But it's something that even now as I'm preaching, I feel guilty for even suggesting that there's a possibility that according to our definition that Jesus wasn't perfect. You know, there is this uh, wonderful scene in the movie Pulp Fiction from years ago, and I realize that Pulp Fiction isn't the best movie to mine sermon <laughs> illustrations from because of all the violence and profanity in that movie. But there's this moment in the movie where the two main characters, Jules and Vincent, played by Samuel L. Jackson and John Travolta, have this near-death experience. And Jules sees this as a moment of clarity. Vincent isn't convinced. And so Jules says, did God stop the bullets? Did God change my Coke into Pepsi or help me find my car keys? We can't judge these things based on merit. And whether what we experienced or not was an according to whom miracle or not is insignificant. What is significant is that I felt touched by God. God got involved. I think that is the important part, the important lesson of the transfiguration. We don't have to understand how Jesus started the world or why Jesus was here. We can kind of form mental gymnastics to understand that this is a precursor and foreshadowing of the resurrection. That's fine. But what we really need to know is that God got involved. And that God continues to be involved in our lives. And as we think about these, these things in our, in our minds, we have to understand that in the Gospels, Jesus is asked 187 questions in those four books. 187 questions. He answers maybe eight of them. The rest he leaves unanswered. He himself asks 305 questions. So maybe faith isn't about certainty. Maybe it's about learning to ask and to sit in the complexity of really good questions. Amen.
Jesus' creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join me in the prayers of the people. Embolden your church as it witnesses to the majesty and mercy of your Son. Move us to share our stories of faithfulness and forgiveness. May our lives proclaim your greatness. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Dwell with your whole creation from the tallest mountain peak to the deepest valley. Bless the work of conservation organizations and protect vital habitats. Support the work of disaster relief agencies around the world, especially the people of Syria, Turkey, and Ukraine. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Give shelter to those lacking safe homes. Spur communities to work for fair housing for all. Protect our neighbors whose dwellings do not keep out dangerous cold or heat. Accompany with your touch those who are homebound, sick, or isolated. We especially remember Beth, Paul, Barb, Lois, Edna, Martin, Carolyn, Grace, Paula, Kevin, Lori, active military, and bring peace and thankfulness of joyful memories to all who have lost loved ones recently. And all those we remember with our hearts or with our voices. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Give food to those in the world who are hungry. Help communities to work towards nutritious meals for all. We ask for the grace to see the abundance of our world and the awareness to help those in need. Help us recognize Jesus' voice in the needs of our neighbors. Make us confident to follow the way of the cross. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive our thanksgiving for the holy ones who have guided us in faithfulness and gathered even the unlikely as your people. With our forebearers in faith and all who have hoped in you, teach us to wait with courage until the promised day dawns. We bring to you our needs and hopes. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share that peace with one another.
Let us pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power, and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore, through Jesus our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should, at all times and in all places, give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who, sharing your life, lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to your own brilliant light. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Mighty, holy, and immortal, you we praise and glorify, you we worship and adore. You formed the earth from chaos, you encircled the globe with air, you created fire for warmth and light, you nourished the lands with water. You molded us in your image, and with mercy higher than the mountains, with grace deeper than the seas, you bless the Israelites and cherish them as your own that also we, estranged and dying, might be adopted to live in your spirit. You called for us through the life and death of Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember your Son, the firstborn of your new creation. We remember his life lived for others and his death and resurrection, which renews the face of the earth. We await his coming when with the world made perfect through your wisdom, all our sins and sorrows will be no more. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and compassionate, send upon us and this meal your Holy Spirit, whose breath revives us for life, whose fire rouses us to love. Enfold us in your arms, all who share this holy food. Nurture in us the fruits of the Spirit, that we may be a living tree, sharing your bounty with all the world. Holy and benevolent God, receive our praise and petitions as Jesus received the cry of the needy and fill us with your blessing until needy no longer and bound to you in love, we feast forever in the triumph of the Lamb through whom all glory and honor is yours, O God, O living one with the Holy Spirit in your holy church now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray in the words most comfortable to each. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we gather at this table, we'll commune pulpit side first, followed by the piano side. There'll be bread at the first station. If you need gluten-free, let me know. If you'd prefer a blessing, come forward with your arms crossed. Wine and grape juice follow with a basket to dispose of your cup as you return to your seats. With that, taste and see that the Lord is good.
Now receive this blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, love kindness, and journey humbly with you. Amen. So, nope. as, since we've been talking a lot about the beginning of our Lenten season, we, one thing that we do as part of our time in church together is we fast. We stop doing something for the season of Lent. And if you've been with us in years past, you might know that there's a certain word we don't say during the Lenten season. Does anybody know what it is? Let's say it all together. Ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah! <laughs> That's exactly right. So, we, this word that we have right here, we are going to take to the back of the sanctuary and hide this. I know, it's really big, isn't it? This is going to be the thing we're going to hide for the season of Lent, and then we're going to see it. Can we all guess when we're going to see this word next? Easter! Easter is exactly right. So, we are going to sing the word Alleluia during the sending hymn, and we are all going to lead the procession out and bury this in a box in the back that we will open on Easter. So, Miss Abby, could I have you stand on this side and hold this corner here? Great. And Miss Riley, if you want to stand behind and hold this corner, and the rest of us will follow behind as we process out. And so I'll invite the assembly to rise as you are able for our blessing before we sing our sending hymn. So you guys hang out. I borrow your binder. Thanks. Hold on, you guys. All right. Receive God's blessing. Miss Abby, hey, you guys, not yet. Come back. Please follow directions. Thank you. Receive God's blessing. The God who faithfully brings forth, just, brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod. Bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen. We join together in singing our sending hymn. <laughs> to community, neighbor, and faith. Go in peace. Love your neighbor. Thank you.